Okay, I think we'll get started. And I'd like to welcome you all to this Wednesday seminar. Thank you. And uh, we do, don't have restrictions, so you can push into the middle and allow other people who are coming late to collect in the, in, in the hall. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we virtually and together meet today. Uh, for most of us, this is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and I embrace their continued connections to this place. Now, I'm truly delighted and honoured to introduce our speaker today, Professor Stephen Nutt. Steve can rightfully claim to be, to be the bedrock and focal point of molecular immunology at WEHI. He arrived at WEHI as an inaugural Metcalf Fellow back in 2001. And this was after experiences in a biotech company in Canada and as a, a student with Meinrad Buslinger in Austria where he discovered the important role of Pax5 in delineating B cells. And for this work he is justifiably famous. In creating his lab here, Steve has followed a powerful, coherent vision that has focused on the transcriptional regulation of multiple cell types, and he's collaborated with many members of the Institute, experimental biologists and bioinformaticians. Steve, as many of you all know, is amazingly productive, he's efficient, he's a joy to work with. And when you get to know him, you discover he gets almost excited as finding, by finding a new bird on a hike as he does by finding a new transcription factor. You might all, he might also gift you an exotic cheese that he cooked up in his home incubator as well. <laughs> now, I've just written a grant with Steve, and so I have his very impressive CV details. A fellow of the Australian Academy of Sciences, an NHMRC Award for Excellence, a Eureka Prize, over 200 publications, over 20,000 citations of his work. He's produced dozens of genetically engineered animal models that have circled the globe and enhanced studies in hundreds of labs around the world. Steve is a scientific powerhouse, a generous mentor, a guiding light for conducting science with balance and rigor. He's a tireless contributor to immunological and scientific communities, and we all benefit from that. I can't tell you how delighted and really privileged we feel that Steve makes WeHi his intellectual home. Today, Steve's going to return to his favourite theme and tell us how immune cells are created with his lecture titled Gene Regulation in the Immune System. Over to you, Steve. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Phil, for the very generous uh, uh, introduction. So, I think as Phil mentioned, I, I spent my whole career working on essentially these sort of questions, how a progenitor cell, <laughs> how a progenitor cell uh, decides to differentiate into uh, different lineages for its progeny, and in this case, cell, how cell A becomes either B or C. It's also inherent to the system that cell B has to then not be able to um, revert back to either A or C, so there are, there are transcriptional processes in place to lock cells into those lineages, and then cells can undergo further maturation steps, uh, such as shown here. Now this sort of diagram, you could draw this uh, in the nematode, and, and, and this would be the transcriptional circuit controlling uh, a cellular process. You know, but in the immune system, it's much more complicated. This is just simply one way of, of um, of showing the, the cell types um, uh, at both a major level, such as B cells and T cells, but also the many differentiation states uh, that these cells undergo during, during their maturation. So today I'm going to try to tackle a couple parts of this, of this complexity. Firstly, I'm going to talk about dendritic cell differentiation. Uh, secondly, I'll talk about plasma cell diversification, and I hope I'll have time at the end to to show you a little bit of our work uh, where we try to tackle the immune system as a whole. So by way of background, uh, dendritic cells are sentinels. They're found throughout the body. They, their main role is to, is to sense danger and present um, antigen uh, to T cells uh, that's um, presented on MHC complexes and activate the immune response where appropriate. And uh, the most important thing for my purpose is that dendritic cells have multiple subsets. 
And the revelation that this occurred is a very much a Weihai phenomena. This was discovered by Ken Shortman and in, in his, in his colleagues in the, um, the early 90s, and for a period of about 20 years, Ken and his colleagues really worked out most of the, the, the cellular structure of the, um, of the dendritical system. But Ken famously really was not an molecular biologist, and so he left, he's left the, um, working out the um, transcriptional structure to people like me. So there's a common uh, dendritic cell progenitor that can differentiate either into plasmacytoid DCs, which are type 1 interferon-producing cells, or into conventional DCs, and they're now called CDC1 and CDC2. Uh, these two lineages have distinct transcriptional profiles uh, using different master regulators, and today I'll focus on CDC1s that, that, that use RF8 and BAD F3. And these cells, given the right um, maturation signals, will produce cytokines such as IL-12 and be able to present antigens both on MHC class 1, but, well, but most canonically in MHC, uh, sorry, in MHC class 2, but most canonically in MHC class 1 to activate um, uh, CD8 T cell responses. So we're, we're interested in essentially how this diversity is set up on a transcriptional level. And we started this project not long after I came back um, to Australia, and this is work I did with, uh, initiated with Lee Wu uh, and, uh, and Alex Duckage and Sebi Karotta and Angela. And we initially, I made a, a P1, uh, and, and, and focused on our transcription factor uh, P1, which we were interested in for a variety of other reasons. And initially I made a P1 GFP reporter mouse, and it was very obvious when we looked at this mouse that all cells of the DC lineages expressed P1. It was highly expressed in conventional DC, uh, type 1 or type 2, and lowly but uniformly expressed in plasmacytoid DCs. And so uh, when Alex Duckage and, and, and Sebastian Carotta uh, joined the lab, they sequentially did projects trying to understand uh, uh, what P1 was doing in, in DC progenitors. And the take home message is if you inactivate P1 in any of the uh, stem or progenitor cells capable of giving rise to the dendritic cell lineage, you essentially ablate the lineage. There's no dendritic cells to be seen. So P1 is absolutely required for a progenitor to differentiate down a, into a DC. P1 likely does many things in these cells, uh, but one thing we did find that, that's striking is that the, the receptor tyrosine kinase FLT3, which is the major cytokine receptor uh, involved in a dendritic cell lineage, absolutely requires P1 for its expression. So this study told us that P1 was important in progenitors, but it told us really nothing about what P1 was doing in conventional dendritic cells or plasmacytoid DCs. So and at this point, uh, Mikhail Chopin joined the lab, and it was his project uh, when he initially arrived to, to, to generate a conditional knockout model where we could investigate the function of P1 in committed uh, dendritic cells and understand their diversification. And so when we set up this model, the results were, compared to uh, the, uh, the results from knocking out P1 in stem cells, was, were quite interesting. P1 was required for CDC1 and CDC2 differentiation, but not absolutely. The CDCs clearly existed without P1. Their numbers were significantly reduced, but they clearly existed and could clearly be identified. And even more surprisingly, plasmatoid DCs, instead of being lost, were actually increased in the absence of P1. This persistence of the, of the uh, conventional DCs was not simply due to inefficient uh, Deletion of P1, because this is RNA-seq data uh, showing that the exon 5, which is the DNA binding domain of P1, which is floxed in these mouse models, is completely gone uh, in the uh, C11C Cree model. So P1 is deleted in these cells. So this leads to the conclusion that progenitors, in the absence of P1, can, can differentiate towards the CDCs, but very inefficiently, and surprisingly actually differentiate towards the PDCs uh, at a much higher rate. So this led us to the hypothesis that high level of P1 that's, that, that is important uh, in the progenitors for CDCs drives a gene or genes that is essential uh, for promoting CDC uh, fate. And uh, Mikhail, as, long, as well as with our collaborators we've, we've, uh, in Gordon Smith's lab uh, in bioinformatics, uh, devised a strategy to, to identify gene X. And we did this by uh, using the following criteria. We thought that gene X should be a CDC-specific gene, so it's specifically turned on in CDCs to drive their expression. It should be directly regulated by PU1, 
uh, as t in terms of DNA binding, and it should be dependent on P1 uh, for its expression. And so we, inter we generated and interrogated the data to analyze this question, and 129 genes fit this, these arbitrary criteria that we um, uh, assigned. And when we looked at the data, luckily in the 125, 29 genes, it was only two transcription factors. Uh, one called uh, ZFP366 or DC script, and another one ZBTB46. For reasons that I won't go into, we decided to focus on DC script. So, if our, our model's right, if we manipulate DC script expression, we should um, uh, give us results that would phenocopy manipulating uh, P1 expression. So, Mikhail set up the following type of experiment. We take bone marrow progenitors, we culture them in FLT3 ligand, our conditions to generate DCs in, in vitro, and then either overexpress DC script with a retrovirus for a gain of function experiment, or to use uh, net, uh, CRISPR technology to inducibly delete um, DC script in the same culture system as a loss of function experiment. And when he did these studies, uh, we found that overexpressing DC script dramatically uh, skews the output of the cultures. It drives CDC1, all CDC differentiation, but predominantly uh, CDC1 cells, and it blocks PDC differentiation. Conversely, if we knock out DC script in the system, we block CDC1 differentiation and resulting and, and, and leading to an increase in the, in the um, production of PDCs. So essentially this, this uh, loss of function of DC script almost perfectly phenocopies uh, P1 deficiency in this system. So th this uh, suggested that um, our model was fundamentally correct that in bone marrow progenitors, P1 is expressed at intermediate level. It, as cells commit to the DC lineage, P1 becomes uh, a high level. And one of the downstream targets of P1 is uh, DC script um, that controls the differentiation of CDCs. So that suggested that uh, uh, you know, our, our general model of how P1 works is right, but it, for, for the understanding DC differentiation, it kick, just kicks the, um, the can one level down, and we have to understand what DC script does uh, to control this process. So to give you a bit of background about this gene, it's a very un understudied gene. There's only 15 papers in PubMed. Uh, it's a largely DC-specific zinc finger transcription, multi-zinc finger transcription factor um, in both uh, uh, mouse, uh, shown here, and in humans. Uh, it's expressed in both CDC1 and CDC2. It's also expressed in any other species where DCs have really been uh, looked at uh, in detail. There is some expression in non-DCs, including some uh, myeloid populations, which I'll, I'll show you a little bit more. And there's some evidence that it's expressed in, in, in a variety of cancer settings, uh, and particularly in the breast. Given there's only 15 papers, there's very little knowledge of what DC script does. Uh, it was proposed, it's proposed to be a repressor, and it was proposed to act as a co-repressor uh, for glutocorticoid receptor in, in monocyte-derived uh, uh, dendritic cells, as well as to as a repressor of IL-10 expression. So given there was really no tools to study uh, DC script, we invested um, in generating these, these tools. Uh, we generated a DC script reporter mouse and a, and a knockout mouse. These were both generated in the, in the MAGIC facility by Andrew um, in consultation with us. Uh, DC, uh, our uh, reporter mouse in incorporates an IRS um, tomato uh, cassette into the free prime uh, UTR of uh, DC script. And when we analyze these mice, we get a uh, very strong and uniform expression of, of, of DC script in, or, and tomato in uh, uh, CDC1 cells, a lower but reasonably uniform expression also in CDC2 cells. And in line with the fact that DC scripts expressed in some macrophage populations, we see in the spleen expression in the red pulp macrophages. Uh, we also see expression in some other tissue macrophages in the body, but, but certainly not all. Um, beyond this expression, there, we, we observed no expression of DC script any, in any other immune cell uh, that we've analyzed. So it's a, it is a, it's, it's, Closer we can get one of the most DC specific genes um, in the genome. To, to knock out DC script, um, we use the CRISPR approach to essentially remove the whole um, coding region. 
uh, the, the, the gene has, the protein has z several zinc fingers spread right across the, um, the protein and we were unsure as exactly which element we wanted to delete so we have just uh, taken the whole thing out. So we have a, certainly a null, a null allele here. And when we analyse these mice, um, we find that Mikhail in his immunity paper was largely right. Uh, these are scripts require for optimal CDC1 differentiation. We have a, uh, a significant reduction in CDC1s in, in a resident population and in, 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 in every organ um, that we examine. There is some increase in CDC2s uh, and some increase in plasma cyto DCs in line with what we saw in our, in our culture system. And I should say that uh, in this case, we're using a mark XCR1 uh, and CD172 to identify CDC1s, but we, we, I won't show you the data, but we use multiple different gating strategies um, to identify these cells, and, and essentially they're all changed in the same way. So I think we're completely confident that DC scripts required for optimal CDC1 differentiation. So this leads um, to two sort of fundamental questions. How is DC script controlling the differentiation of CDC1s? And what is, and what is the impact of, D, of, of DC script deficiency on uh, CDC1 function? So first to tackle the developmental issue, we uh, took up our usual strategy, which is to uh, isolate the cells and, and profile their transcriptome using RNA sequencing. This is work with Mikhail did in, in collaboration with, with Hannah and Gordon. And here we get a very striking result. If we compare um, the transcriptome of knockout and wild type CDC1s, there's about 6,000 uh, uh, differential expressed genes, a, a, a huge number. In, in contrast, if we look at the CDC2s, we find only about 600 DE genes. So there's about a, a, at least a tenfold difference and, a, and a, also an intensity difference between these two populations. If we examine the genes that change um, in the absence of uh, DC script, uh, in CDC1s, we, we noticed that many of the markers that we would use to um, define CDC1s, such as in this case XCR1, but also um, in integrin CD103, are downregulated in the absence of DC script. So there's a general loss of genes associated with CDC1. And conversely, if we look at CDC2 genes, and then CD11B would be one in this context, as well as SERP alpha, CD172 we see a general derepression de um, of these genes in CDC1s, but not in CDC2s. And if we uh, take this sort of anecdotal analysis and then and, and take a genome-wide using gene center enrichment analysis, uh, if we look at the genes that are different expressed between the knockout and the wild type and ask what's the expression of those, sorry, how are those genes uh, the, those genes that are the different expressed between knockout and wild type that are in either signature for either CDC1 or CDC2, how are they expressed? And if you look at CDC1 signature genes, we see a general downregulation of the genes uh, in the absence of DC script, whereas CDC2 signature genes are upregulated. So we're, we're still completely confident that a, a DC script deficient CDC1 is a CDC1 uh, by all criteria but it really has an identity crisis. It's, starting, it's losing uh, expression of genes that characterize CDC1s and, and upregulating genes that require for CDC2s. To try to understand how this is working, uh, we performed uh, genome-wide analysis of DC script using uh, cut, the cut and tag uh, protocol. And I should, here I should shout out uh, Daniel Brown in the SCORE lab. He got us onto the cut and tag uh, protocol very early after the publication and helped us develop the protocol in, uh, and it was analyzed by Hannah and Gordon. So firstly, if we have a look at where DC script binds or the, the extent of DC script binding in CDC1 or CDC2, we see that in line with the, with the fact that DC script regulates many more genes in CDC1s, it has many more binding sites. There's about 30,000 in, in the CDC1 genome, where there's only about 3,000 binding sites in CDC2s then there is substantial overlap between the, the CDC2 binding sites between the two uh, populations. So this, is, again, is in agreement with, 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 a, with having a much more profound function in CDC1. We also had a look to see how does DC script bind, binding in CDC1s compare to the other two major um, master regulators of this lineage, which is RF8 and BAT-F3. And so we downloaded and analyzed um, uh, genome-wide binding data for both of these guys. And this is shown here in the Venn diagram or, or, or in, a, in, a, in a figure format here. 
And essentially you can see that there's a really large overlap between the binding of DC script and IRF8 or DC script and BATA3. More than half of the BATA3 or IRF8 sites um, have a, a, a proximal binding of DC script. And that's essentially shown here um, with these um, density plots. So I take a message is that DC script binding is vastly in excess in CDC1 versus CDC2, and in CDC1 it binds with the other major regulators um, of the lineage. So this suggests to us that DC script is really part of the core transcriptional program that's driving uh, CDC1s. It also, uh, subsequently we realized it also involved in regulating this core program, because one of the targets of, of DC script we identified was IRF8. Now IRF8 is essentially the signature uh, transcription factor for CDC1s. It's, it's expressed in all, all cells and is absolutely required for their existence. Interestingly also, IRF8 is a haplomys efficient gene in CDC1s with a significant reduction uh, uh, in heterozygous mice or people. So if we, uh, our data would suggest that DC script is actually a direct regulator of our of RF8 expression uh, in CDC1s. And this is shown uh, at multiple levels. Here at the RNA level, RF8 expression is downregulated. At the protein level, it's downregulated uh, quite similarly. And perhaps most convincingly, if we look at our cut and tag data, uh, we can see very nice binding of DC script to an element that's called the plus 32 enhancer of RF8, um, which is uh, essentially downstream of the gene. And as well as DC script, this enhancer binds P1, BATA3, and RF8 itself. And it's thought that this enhancer is, is essential to set up an auto regulatory loop to drive uh, maximal RF8 expression. So we think that R, the DC script is regulating RF8 uh, through the activity of this enhancer. To try to test whether this is actually an essential step in differentiation, we, attempt, we tried some rescue experiments where we take either wild type or DC script knockout. Uh, bone marrow cultures, uh, wild type generates a certain amount of uh, uh, CDC1s in these cultures, the knockout generates less, as I've shown you previously. And we then tried to uh, rescue the expression, the, the, the differentiator of CDC1s by either complementing them with DC script again or expressing IRF8 on its own. And both rescuing with DC script or expressing IRF8 rest restores um, effectively the number of uh, CDC1s in these cultures. So we think that. Uh, this is reasonably good evidence that, that the key, one of the key um, steps that DC script does to control CDC1 differentiation is to turn on RF8. So the second part of this, uh, the second question that we wanted to answer with these mice is that the residual CDC1s that, that, that are found in a knockout, are they still functional? And for CDC1s, the two core functions we were wanted to look at were cytochrome production, particularly interleukin-12, and antigen presentation. And again, our data suggests that, that, CDC, that DC script is really a core player in CDC1 differentiation. It controls IRF, it absolutely controls IRF12 uh, production by CDC1s. This, is, this can be seen at the protein level where a, a stimulated DC produces a certain amount of uh, interleukin-12 and, and, and that uh, expression is largely lost when you don't have uh, DC script. This effect is transcriptional. Um, there's an uh, inability to upregulate the IL-12 uh, beta chain uh, RNA in, in the absence of DC script, and it appears direct. There's very strong binding both to the promoter and, and to, to sort of um, free prime elements uh, to the IL-12 gene. So I think this is very strong data that DC script is a, is a regulator of IL-12 in CDC1s. One of the canonical functions of IL-12 from this setting is to um, control infection with parasites, such as uh, toxoplasma. So we, we took advantage of the fact that um, uh, Chris Tompkin has this uh, systems running in his lab, and we infected DC script knockout mice with toxoplasma with the prediction that they'll have trouble dealing with uh, the, the parasite, given their lack of IL-12, and that is indeed the case. We see uh, larger parasitemia uh, in a DC script knockout. The other canonical function of um, CDC1s is to uh, capture and present antigens um, on uh, MHC class 1 to CD8 T cells. And I won't go into details, but this, this uh, uh, process is also greatly inhibited in the absence of, of DC script. At, at present, we don't have a very good uh, molecular understanding as to why antigen presentation requires, requires DC script. 
Um, but our feeling is it's, it's, it's uh, something to do with the ability of the cell to recognise and uptake the antigen as opposed to the um, ability to process the antigen intracellularly. So given that th these uh, mice lack both the ability to, uh, to cross-present antigens to, to uh, uh, CD8 T cells via, via CDC1s and the ability to make IL-12 from these cells, one would predict from the literature that these mice will have, uh, inability, uh, will have a difficulty controlling tumours, and that is indeed the case if we inject uh, subcutaneous, uh, classic subcutaneous tumour models such as MC38 cells into these mice, the DC script uh, knockout cells have trouble controlling the tumour. And these sort of, uh, uh, we're quite excited by these sort of models as a way of um, trying to understand what genes like DC script and, and CDC1s in general are doing in, in, in controlling tumours. So to conclude this, this part, DC script uh, is expressed uh, in CDCs. It's required for them to be produced in normal frequency and for their function. And essentially all this work I uh, presented was done by um, uh, Sheng Bo, who's a PhD student, third year PhD student in, in the lab, co-supervised with Mikhail, who also um, contributed much, much to this uh, particular project. And Sheng Bo and Mikhail look pretty, pretty smug there, and it's because we just published this paper in Science and Biology about uh, three weeks ago on, on this subject. So there's still some open questions um, that we're interested in tackling uh, with DC script. We don't really have a good feeling for how it controls gene expression. Why is DC script less important in CDC2s? That's not clear, even though because it's clearly expressed at, at a reasonable level. And are there functions of DC script beyond DCs? We know there are, we just, we, we, and we just don't know exactly what they are at the moment. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears. The second part of the talk is to uh, talk about our work on plasma cell um, diversity. B cells differentiate into antibody secreting plasma cells that are for a variety of processes. They can be, they can be activated directly, um, either follicular B cells or various other subsets such as marginal zone cells can differentiate almost directly into a short-lived plasma blast. These, these cells live for about a week in a mouse or in a person and uh, generate an early, uh, early um, wave of low affinity antibody. The cells can also undergo events such as class switch recombination and somatic hypermutation in structures such as the germinal centers to, to produce the high affinity antibody that we need uh, for many of our immune functions. And the outputs of germinal centers are plasma cells, which are long-lived and post-mitotic cells that produce high affinity antibody, or memory B cells, which uh, give us a, a starting material for the next round of infection. And this process uh, has to be tightly controlled. It's essential for our health. If we don't generate enough antibody secreting cells, we're, we have very severe immune deficiency. It under, underpins essentially all vaccine uh, models that are currently used. But on the flip side, if we generate too many antibody secreting cells or the inappropriate ones uh, during this process, antibodies are a major pathological mediator in, in, in many um, autoimmune diseases, but other, other settings such as um, transplant rejection. So getting the, 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 the process of differentiating a B cell into a plasma cell in, in both qualitative and quantitative uh, steps is, is crucial. So work from uh, a number of us about uh, six years ago uh, profiled the, the transcription of all stages of late B cell differentiation um, in a mouse. And this data generated what we call the plasma, plasma cell signature, which is the 300 genes um, that are essential for this, uh, that, are, that, are, that are characterizing uh, all stages of plasma cell differentiation. More recently, we've um, conducted the same sort of analysis uh, from human samples and find that essentially the process is really highly conserved between the, the, the two species. About 250 of the 300 genes um, uh, uh, have human homologs, and of those, about 80% of them are expressed in plasma cells in a similar way. So that essentially the core program that drives a plasma cell is the same in both species. But we also know that there are sources of diversity um, in, in antibody secreting cells. And so we're interested in so moving beyond the, the core signature and now asking what are the, the, the subtleties that give us um, diversity of immune responses um, uh, and antibody production. We know there are different types of precursors that generate uh, different plasma cells. We know there's different triggers and tissue involved and stimuli. Uh, 
And all this results in cells that have different isotypes of the, of the antibody they produce that, that reside in different tissues and have different longevity. And so today I'm going to just talk about one aspect of this, which is uh, tissue diversity of plasma cells. So on the left is um, uh, places in, in, in our bodies where plasma cells are, are commonly uh, are found. This include the, um, the, the uh, upper airways, the gastrointestinal tract, the urogenital tract, of course, the lymphoid organs, the meningi layers of the, um, of the brain, and the bone marrow. And so we've undertaken, uh, these are difficult tissues, many to, to extract uh, from, from, from people, so we've uh, undertaken this analysis initially in the mouse using our GFP reporter to identify um, plasma cells. And you can see here we can very easily identify plasma cells from lymphoid organs, uh, shown here where they're rare populations, or the gastrointestinal tracts, such as the small or large intestine, where plasma cells become one of the dominant um, cell types. And finally, there's a, one particular specialized population of plasma cells that we're quite interested in, and these are the, the ones in the memory gland that during lactation are the source of the mat uh, maternal antibody that's uh, important to, to set up the um, immune homeostasis in, uh, uh, in infants. There's not much known about memory, memory gland plasma cells, with the exception that they're, they're predominantly IgA uh, secreting cells, and there's a clonal relationship between the, the plasma cells in the small intestine and, and the memory gland, so we, the, we, the one is derived from the other, we expect. But if we use our GFP reporter system, we can see that, again, um, Plasma cells are easily identifiable in a, in a lactating memory gland of a mouse. Uh, they represent one of the most common immune cells uh, to be found there, and they are 99% um, IgA positive cells. And if we essentially just quantify this over time, there is, there is um, it's of interest to us that the, the, plasma, the, the memory gland is an induced organ of plasma cell um, uh, uh, existence. There's, there's virtually no uh, plasma cells in a in a male or a or a uh, non-pregnant uh, female uh, breast, but late during pregnancy and then uh, during lactation, the numbers go up to really quite substantial numbers uh, being present. And interestingly, these numbers collapse after the cessation of uh, of lactation, although they maintain them at many at many fold higher than the basal level, uh, even up to six months after after lactation is completed. So we're interested in um, looking at all these populations and asking uh, how do plasma cells in different tissues, um, how, how are they similar and different between each other? So we uh, duly isolated um, RNA from all these populations and Alaria uh, with Gordon did the bioinformatics. And when we align these populations in things like a, a Venn diagram, we can see that again our core signature uh, concept is true. 90% of the genes are expressed are similar between all populations of antibody secreting cells, regardless of the um, organ, but there are clear um, tissue-specific uh, uh, genes as well. And if you look at this in a different way on a, on a sort of MDS plot, uh, these tissue-specific um, patterns become very clear uh, with each organ um, uh, sort of occupying a different place on, on this particular graph. Um, and just to show you some examples of tissue-specific uh, markers, these are some chemokine receptors. CCR10 is generally a marker of IgA plasma cells in mucosa sites, whereas CCR9, for example, is a small intestine-specific uh, 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 transcript, and uh, GPCR15 uh, is a colon-specific um, transcript. And so there are, many, there are many genes that are expressed in these sort of interesting patterns that we're trying to now understand uh, their role in the, in the homeostasis in these various tissue. Um, we also observed, as I said before, that plasma cells uh, in, in one month and six months after lactation uh, ceases, the number of plasma cells uh, present in the breast drops substantially, but it's still uh, much, much higher than the, than the basal level, suggesting that these are long-lived cells that can now reside in this organ for, for you know, in the context of six months, uh, virtually the life of a mouse. So we also profiled the, the gene expression pro profile of these long-lived uh, memory gland plasma cells. And they essentially, both at one month and six months uh, post-lactation, uh, cluster together. And interestingly, they cluster away from their original source, which is the gut uh, plasma cells and the lactating plasma cells. And in this dimension, they start to resemble the, the, um, the bone marrow plasma cells. 
And if we ask what are the genes that change between these populations, here's an example of three genes involved in, in the survival of B cells and plasma cells. Uh, BCMA, BAF receptor, and IL-6 receptor. And you can see very nicely that, for instance, with BAF receptor, it's normally a, a marker of bone marrow plasma cells, not in short-lived cell uh, or immediately produced cells uh, during lactation in the mammary gland, but the longer-lived cells, one month and six months post, post lactation, the expression of BAF receptor now resembles uh, the bone marrow plasma cells. An IL-6 uh, receptor has a very similar pattern. So this would suggest to us that these cells are becoming long-lived and there's a niche that's supporting their survival. We don't know what that niche is, but we just uh, dipped our toe a little bit in imaging to try to have a look at this problem. And uh, Caleb Dawson just joined my lab and one of his projects will be to try to understand the niches that keep these uh, plasma cells alive in different tissue. Uh, you can see it in a lactating uh, mouse uh, breast, the IgA cells are very easily identifiable. They're isolated individually uh, uh, in the organ. And we have these quite in interesting images of, of an of a IgA plasma cell closely associated with some sort of stromal element. And so the question is, what are these um, uh, cells? And can this tell us about the niche that keeps these cells alive? So regardless of where plasma cells are generated in your body, ultimately a proportion of those uh, circulate uh, into the bone marrow where they um, reside uh, uh, long term and, and, and in people this has been shown to, bone marrow plasma cells are re, have been shown to uh, persist for many decades. So essentially the bone marrow is a sample of all the immunological challenges you've had throughout your life. So if these cells are all coming from different parts of your body and have different stimuli, the question we're interested in is do they remember their stimuli um, or, or do all their cells then become um, uh, sort of adapted to the, the bone marrow requirement. And we think that they do remember. Here's just some examples. Again, with chemokines, chemo uh, CCR10, which, as I said before, is an IgA plasma cell element in mucosal sites, is also an IgA plasma cell element in bone marrow, which presumably derived from these mucosal sites, whereas the other non-IgA plasma cells in the bone marrow do not express CCR10. And conversely, CXCR3, which is more of a lymphoid uh, marker in, in the context of, of, of plasma cells, is expressed in non-IGA plasma cells, but not IGA plasma cells. So there's clearly um, transcriptional memory of the origin of those plasma cells. Now, this is a, a system that is absolutely ideally set up for single-cell RNA-seq. And so we perform this sort of analysis. This is um, single-cell RNA-seq data on human bone marrow plasma cells. We've also done a similar analysis on, um, uh, on uh, mouse uh, plasma cells. And essentially, the plasma cells in this patient are, are, are individual, are clustered uh, independently. And then we've collocated them according to the isotype of the antibody um, they are expressing. And you can clearly see that there are, there are relatively few IgM and IgD expressing cells in this person, as we may expect. Uh, and, but they have large clusters of the green of IgG or IgA expressing cells that are, that are, that are are physically distinct from each other in this, in this um, Tisney plot. Moreover, if we were to take these IgG plasma cells and, and subdivide them into the four IgG isotypes, one, two, three, four, in, in humans, again, these four isotypes cluster uh, separately uh, within the bone marrow compartment. So this suggests to us that uh, the hypothesis is true, and indeed, these plasma cells that have gone to the bone marrow are maintaining the transcriptional memory uh, of, the, of the site for where they've... Um, uh, arose uh, with the, their, their hemoglobin isotype as one surrogate for that process. So to summarise this part, uh, plasma cells have a core signature that's expressed in all cells, but then they are superimposed that, on top of that, they have at least tissue-specific uh, signatures. That, uh, and this is a similar concept that's been described for other, uh, other tissue immune cells, such as macrophages. Uh, the mammary gland is a particularly interesting case for us because it's a, 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 an organ that acquires the ability to support plasma cells uh, during a particular stage in life. Uh, but after, uh, their, after lactation is finished, these cells persist, suggesting that there's a long-lived niche that's been created. And the bone marrow seems to be the site where all this meets um, in the complexity of our immune response. So the final um, little bit of a like, few slides I'd like to show you um, is then instead of looking at individual parts of the immune system, try to think about the immune system as a whole. 
And this is really difficult for one lab uh, to really tackle. And so the way we've uh, uh, gone about this question is to be involved in the ImGen project, Immunological Genome Project, um, which is essentially a consortium of about 15 labs, um, predominantly in the US, that are focused on, on the genomics of our mouse immune systems. And one of the projects that we reported a couple of years ago is an atlas of uh, cis regulatory regions uh, in, in the mouse immune system, which is, I think, illustrative of, of this sort of approach. So the concept of Imgen is that all the labs are specialists in their favorite cell types, and we all uh, produce the cells under, under a fairly standardized uh, uh, SOP. Uh, and then the samples are all sent to, to Boston, where they're processed, uh, in this case, for TAC-seq and, and, and RNA-seq. So in this particular study, we uh, generated uh, matching uh, data for RNA-seq and TAC-seq from 86 populations in the immune system. Uh, we, uh, after processing the data, we found about over 300,000 distinct uh, open chromatin regions uh, in the immunological genome. So there's a huge, to give you an idea of the scale of the problem. And this data is all uh, freely available on the Imgen website. You can, you can use browsers to, you can use tools to um, analyze gene expression across the data and new samples are being added every year uh, to divide the extra uh, diversity in, in these populations. The ataxic data is also available via standard sort of browser uh, approaches. And these are great tools for really looking at individual questions such as is this gene expressed in plasma cells as, sh as shown here. But we were also interested in uh, the question of can we use this data because of the, both the breadth of the data and the granularity of the data uh, to draw up some principles about how genes are regulated in the immune system. And so initially we identified, uh, mapped all the RNA that was expressed across all the different cell types and then divided the, uh, the peaks that we got from the attack seek into peaks that are associated with transcriptional start sites or peaks that are associated with correlated um, open chromatin regions of, 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 of distal elements, so essentially enhancers, et cetera. If we uh, use uh, Pearson correlation to, to cluster this data, you can see that the cell, various cell types cluster based on their RNA expression. This is how we would always do uh, this sort of analysis. They cluster pretty similarly, perhaps a little worse, uh, less efficiently by using transcriptional start sites as the, as the clustering mechanism. But the, 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 the most superior methodology to identify a cell um, using this data is to use the, the sum of the distal um, open chromatin regions uh, within, within a particular cell type. So this suggests, and, this, and smaller studies have already, have previously shown this, is that you know, essentially the enhancer collection of, cell, of a cell is a better marker of the cell type than even the RNA that's expressed by that cell. We then use that data to ask a very simple question. What, um, percent of the variance of expression of any given gene across those 86 cell types can be explained by either changes in accessibility of a promoter or an enhancer. Uh, and these are the 17,000 genes that are expressed in the immunological genome. Uh, about 5% of them are unexplained, so where the red is, is genes that we don't really understand what, how they're, they're regulated. Um, but if one looks at the, uh, the blue and the green, one can see that um, there's about a third of the genes what we call promoter logic genes, and so changes in the accessibility of the transcriptional start site largely can explain uh, their expression across the immune system. Uh, and con contra contrast is about 40% of genes that um, are predominantly regulated by distal sort of enhancer elements, and some genes obviously fit in, in, into both categories. So just to finish, here's a, an example of a gene. Um, this is uh, DAP12, which is a, a signaling adapter in, in genes like, in cells like, such as NK cells. Uh, the, the, the top three rows are the, the signal, a normalized attack seq signal for three enhancers that are correlated with DAP12 expression. And the bottom row is the expression in individual cell types um, across our data set of DAP12. And you can essentially see that the, the use of these enhancers is, is non-intuitive. So, at, uh, NK cells use enhancer 1 and enhancer 2. Um, contrast myeloid cells use enhancer 1 and enhancer 3 and not 2. Plasmocytodesis, which is last row, use enhancer 2 and 3. And uh, developing uh, B and T cells generally use enhancer 3. So it's, so it's largely a, a combination of these particular enhancers that, is, that ultimately gives you the expression pattern that we observed. <coughs> 
and this is not an unusual phenomena um, in the system. There's thousands of genes that have uh, multiple correlated uh, enhancer elements across the uh, genome, including many hundreds of genes with, 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 with greater than 10 uh, uh, open chromatin regions. Uh, and it, this is essentially the IL-7 receptor, which is an example. The IL-7 receptor has about 28 uh, correlated uh, uh, open chromatin regions across the genome. So finally, we're very interested in, in um, increasing the granularity of this data by trying to uh, predict uh, action accessibility by transcription factors within this data. Uh, this is a subject that you can do, but we all know there's a huge amount of false um, positives and negatives in that sort of uh, analysis. Our data predicts activators versus repressors uh, reasonably well, and we can also oh. use it to identify clusters of uh, motifs that correlate with a transcription factor of interest. And so this is the sort of work uh, we're trying to now refine. And the current work in Imgen is to add a large data set of histone marks and uh, other, other chromatin landscape phenomena uh, to this data to try to increase the, um, the resolution of the analysis. So just to finish up, um, firstly, a, a shout out to my lab. They kept the, uh, the whole, sh the whole uh, show on the road last year <laughs> uh, during a reasonably difficult time. Uh, today I've talked about the, our DC work, which is really spe spearheaded by Shing uh, Shengbo and, and Mikhail, and our B cell work, which is head headed uh, largely by uh, Julie. Uh, you might have seen Stephanie talk last year, and hopefully Simon will also talk in this forum um, sometime this year. We have lots of colleagues that help us. I don't know, hopefully I've mentioned them all as I went and go through. I'd particularly like to highlight Wei and uh, Gordon and, and their teams who really are essential for everything we do. Imgen is a large, I'm, I'm just one cog in a large um, wheel. We're responsible for the B-cell data and at, and at the moment that's largely been driven uh, by Julie. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. That was a wonderful tour de force overview of uh, transcriptional factor biology and many cell types. So questions for Steve, John at the back. And Steve, you may have to repeat them into the microphone. I'm fascinated by the mammary gland B cells. I also like cross-species comparison. And I believe that cows are quite special because they <laughs> produce it for about 24 hours and then no more IgGs. I don't how memory glands obviously easily accessible, but maybe too much of an experiment. But what do you, what's my question? My question is, <laughs> can you look at other species and see, because I believe that cows are just one part of the spectrum. Yeah. Just see whether there is a difference there. Okay, so John's question is um, whether different species use different um, you, you, anybody secreting cells in the mammary gland, uh, their function and their, and their sort of dynamics is different between different species with cow as an example. Believe it or not, we, we've thought of that. Um, <laughs> Julie, Julie is, um, is, is more qualified than me on this subject, but yeah, certainly cow, certainly some mammals use uh, the way they produce antibody and, and, it's, and the classes of antibody they produce is really different. Um, mouse is similar to human, which is, uh, I guess, lucky. Um, but yeah, I agree. We have, thought, we have certainly thought of that, and, and obviously cow would be one source that is relatively easy to obtain. Yeah. Can you So uh, I, I want to go back to this script. DC script. DC script um, bound together with other transcription factors that were important in the lineage. But it also bound to regions of the genome that didn't give an open chromatin signal in the attack seeks essentially bound to everything. Have you got any theory on that? Yeah, um, Anna's asking, DC, our data suggested that DC script bound to both open and closed chromatin. Um, yes, that's true. I, I think the, the, the proportion is relatively low. It's, that's, that's something 80 or 90% open. Um, so beyond that, I don't have an explanation. There's no correlation that the closed chromatin areas don't correlate with the other factors. Um, so whether this is just spurious binding or whether this is real binding that 
um, yeah, like indirect binding. I don't know. We don't. We we're not. We really don't have much of an idea. There is a, a motif that DC script is supposed supposed to bind to. We didn't really get that back from our data, so we're not one hundred percent sure how it interacts with DNA at the moment. You know, it could be binding to histones as well, right? Uh, so, yeah, so Anna's asking whether the DC script interacts with some of the other transcription factors that we saw over, um, it, it, it uh, bound closely to. Definitely, we've considered that. Uh, I think that would be our favourite hypothesis. Uh, we have one of those in mind, um, but we don't have any data to, to support that or not. But, yeah, I think that would be a very attractive idea. No, it, it's, it doesn't look like that. It, it, the, oh, sorry. The question is whether, whether uh, the memory gland has B cells and the B cells differentiate into plasma cells essentially in the, in the organ. Uh, no, I think we see only on the whole 90 and something, well over 90% of the cells are IgA plasma cells. It, the available evidence is very little evidence, but the available evidence suggests that they migrate direct as plasma blasts from the, the gut. Which is a quite an unusual phenomenon. So, I think in a second pregnancy, mm -hmm. when there's a, a new increase in plasma cells, is that because they leave quiescent and start dividing again, or, or is that because they have new plasma cells? Yeah, we don't know. That's a good question. We, we, we've devised some ways to, to look at that. Um, that's that's exactly the type of question because that may be where the the evolutionary advantage to having uh, memory cells. Uh, maintain for for a next pregnancy. That would be the obvious answer, but we we, we haven't got any, any data yet on that. Yeah, so the question is, is will InGen have a single cell version? Yes, uh, we have that, some of that data comes from that. Um, InGen hasn't found the single cell approach to be as practical. In terms of present, you know, in terms of interlab variation and in terms of presentation, it just hasn't it hasn't worked as well as as the the bulk population stuff does. There's a practical problems there. Yeah, well, the, the other antibodies go through the, you know, the, 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 the fetus can absorb antibodies through the, through the um, placenta as well. Um, I think the, the argument is that the, 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 the first thing the baby needs to set up is its, is its immune homeostasis in the gut. And so getting those, I think, getting those IgA antibodies across uh, as rapidly as possible helps to establish that sort of setup. Um, there are some. There is some IgG. It's not only IgA. There is some IG, IgG that gets transferred, but it's predominantly IgA. And, and it's been shown in, in um, mouse models that that the antibody is important for setting levels um, of, of other immune cells in, in, the, in the developing gut, or the, 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 the shortly post post uh, natal gut. Uh, so the question is, does, why does IL-7 receptor have 27 correlated enhancers? Um, there's mo it has multiple expression, multiple cell types it's expressed in, so that, that was one answer, that, um, that there are B cells, T cells, ILCs, uh, PDCs all express IL-7 receptor, and they presume, I imagine, I haven't looked into that data, but I imagine though they're using different enhancers. Um, why couldn't they? 
Th well, they, they do. In so the question is why do why do why do we have all this? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the data that that green and blue thing I showed with the with the distal with the TSSs and the, and the distal enhancers is is essentially one version of that. So there are many genes that do have just accessibility at the start site drives their expression. So the promoter is important. Um, those genes are enriched for housekeeping genes, as you might expect, although not always. So you know, if you want a gene to always be expressed at the same level, you don't need to have too many fancy things. Um, but something like IL-7 receptor, you know, you know, maybe it's just physically I impossible. Um, uh, genes such as P1 are important for IL-7 receptor in B cells. P1 is not expressed in T cells, so you need something else, I guess. So th th that's just the way it's evolved. Do you have more? Sure. Okay. Thanks, Steve. On that note, that IL-7 receptor, is there data available for human promoters as well? Because obviously, IL-7 Yeah, yeah. So the we we the so encode has done a lot of. Oh, sorry. The, the question is: Is there similar data from the Imgen attack data in, in for human samples? So encode is, is leads that, and they have done. And there's, there's also a European consortium um, that has also done a similar thing. The limitation of that data is that by definition the cell types are harder to get, and so there's a lot more cell lines and cultured cells uh, in those sort of approaches. We did try some cross-species analysis, and it turned into a whole quagmire of, of difficulty. We tried to map GWAS changes to enhancers in mice, and it was just, there was just so much uncertainty in, on, in synteny, synteny, synteny of, the, of the synteny of the genome to, to really understand that, I think. It's, diff, it's a difficult problem. Um, but I would expect something, you know, some, some of these complicated genes will be regulated similarly, and some won't be. I think there's probably a lot of evolution that happens there. Last question. Otherwise, oh, Matt. Uh, quick one. I was um, really interested in your data showing that the enhancer profile is the best measure of cell identity. I mean, should that be taking the place of gene set enrichment analysis on whole RNA seq well, it's, but it's harder to, yeah. Uh, so the question is, um, should you use enhancer profiling to, to map cell types um, instead of RNA expression? I guess RNA is, 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 is easy to get to. It, it, they, they both work in terms of um, dividing up the samples. Um, you know, we, I think we would think that the, the way you look at enhancers, we did a lot of analysis also of, of ordering of events. Like, so you would predict that the enhancers open up before the gene comes on and during developmental series, and that is indeed what happens. So some of it is predictive too. It's going to tell you what the cell will do in, into the future. Um, yeah, in situations where that exists, that's a very useful way of um, of defining uh, uh, cell activities. And with attack seek, the, the the intervals you're using are quite discrete, as opposed to histone marks. And so it's it's quite a it's quite a powerful way to do it. But you have to have that data. I think RNA data we can all generate in our sleep. Um, that's the advantage, right? Okay, I think that's it. It remains to thank Steve for a fantastic seminar. Thank you. Steve.